shoes are for me a complex in Berlin. Grown up as a worker class kid, for me it was not possible to get more than one pair of shoes. But the first pair of shoes I felt love with is the Adidas Superstar. I bought my shoes from a friend who was doing exchange in the US. I put US dollars in an envelope and sent it via post to the US. A month later, I got a package with shoes in it. I wanted to have a white one with black stripes, but my friend in the US uh, misunderstood and sent me a black pair with white stripes. But when I went on the street, everybody was getting crazy because the black-white one was uh, really rare. In Berlin, this was something like a status symbol. For us kids, it was back then the shoes. It was my way of flexing. It's still the shoes, by the way, I'm still flexing. in Berlin. What they really pride themselves on are these vintage stores. It's almost a pride in buying something that nobody else has. You cannot think about German football without talking about Adidas and their innovation. And you cannot talk about German hip hop culture without mentioning Puma. Not only because these brands are based in Germany, but also because they base their designs on the culture around them. In sneaker culture, brands could always rest on their laurels. Adidas and Puma have enough legacy models to fall back on, but they're innovating. They are going to challenge how you feel about the best footwear brand every year. I've never been the type of girl who likes to go on big shopping sprees and wear high heels. I wanted to be able to climb fences with my shoes. And sooner or later, I realized that there's a big cultural and historical aspect behind sneakers as well. I'd never really thought about being a collector. I more got into it when I moved out of my parents' home with 150 pairs and I realized, wow, okay, so this is quite a collection already. I just love hunting and digging whether it's already worn shoes, classics like the Forum. Although we are the capital of Germany, we are still one of the poorest cities in Germany, so I think anybody coming to Berlin really has to hustle to stay here. But the culture of Berlin is very alternative, very free-minded, and Berlin is a colorful city, so the people need colorful sneakers. I think you can find anything a sneakerhead is after in here. So one of my favorites is definitely this one. The Adidas rivalry, an absolute classic. You cannot think of sneaker culture without mentioning Adidas or Puma. Two of the largest, most consistently relevant brands in the history of sneaker culture exist in the same small town in Germany. So when you think about what Germany has produced to sneaker culture, and staggering. When I started at Adidas, I started in Herzo in Germany, and it was still very provincial in that sense. And most of the people that you worked with were really local Germans, and they were craftsmen and cobblers, and their parents had worked there. But what was always unique about Adidas was it had a global reach even back then when it came out of the little workshop there in, in Herzo. I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I could buy those shoes with that German writing on the box. And you watched the Olympics, the World Cup, Wimbledon. It always seemed to be carrying the three stripes. I'm a kid from the late 80s, early 90s, and Puma played a massive role in building what we call today the culture. Being a skateboarder, being a basketball player, listening to hip hop at that time, Puma was part of me growing up. We're a sport company before everything, and everything that we do should be done through the lens of sport or through the understanding of the roots of the company. And we are building the archive of tomorrow by referring where we're from. Nicht nur, dass ich jetzt seit über 40 Jahren bei Puma bin, sondern dass äh, mir von ja, Kindheit an äh, Puma besser gefallen hat wie alle anderen Marken. Ich trage vom T-Shirt bis zur Unterhose bis zum Socken immer nur Puma.
Trotzdem, mein Vater ja jahrzehntelang bei Adidas gearbeitet hat. Und äh, mein Vater hat es gar nicht, gar nicht gerne gesehen, dass ich eben Pumaschuhe mit nach Hause gebracht habe. Aber für mich war festgestanden, eben, ich bleibe bei Puma und möchte nicht die Schuhe von meinem Vater anziehen. When you buy a pair of Adidas shoes back in the day, you ask the question, what does this even mean? This word, is it a name? Where does it come from? But when you think about the brand itself, for me, it's much more about sort of the founder. It's about Adi Dassler kind of working with athletes. He was a creator. He was a designer. Die beiden Brüder Rudolf und Adolf Dassler waren sehr sportbegeistert und irgendwann kam, in, kam ihnen die Idee, eine neue Schuhfabrik zu gründen. Die beiden Dasslers hatten ja 1924 offiziell ja ihre Firma gegründet, da gelebt. Man hat sich natürlich auch, da ist den Erfolg geschuldet, immer weiter voneinander entfernt. Man hat verschiedene Geschäftsmodelle gehabt, die die einen wollten eben nur mehr in die Produktion, die anderen mehr in die Werbung. Von in der Stadt musste man sich ganz schnell entscheiden, bist du ein Puma oder bist du ein Adidas-Freund. Und so ging, das durch die, ging durch dieser Streit durch die ganze, äh, ja. Und als Heizung halt Aura musste man sich dann einfach entscheiden, gehst du zu den Puma oder zu den Adidas-Sportvereinen, gehst du zum Puma-Bäcker oder zum Adidas-Bäcker, gehst du in die Puma-Tankstelle oder in die Adidas-Tankstelle. Das war eigentlich selbstverständlich, dass äh, jeder, der eben mit Adidas sympathiert hat, zu den Adidas-Leuten gegangen ist und äh, mehr Puma natürlich zu den Puma. With Adidas and Puma, they're literal brothers. And when you look at their historical contribution, these are arguably the two most consistently relevant brands in the entire history of sneaker culture. The Adidas Archive boasts some of the culture's most long-lasting shoes. When you look at things like Superstar, those were the basketball shoes of the day. Puma might be the first prominent basketball brand with a Clyde Fraser signature shoe. Was uh, Walt Clyde Fraser besonders Wert drauf legt, ist, dass er lange vor Air Jordan seinen Namen auf den Schuh. Puma became such a big part of hip hop because basketball is obviously very much hip hop. 1968, when Tommy Smith raised his fist for Black Power wearing a sweat. That is one of the greatest moments in history, and it was a Puma moment. But then also for Adidas, you have the Stan Smith. Everybody wore that shoe on and off the court. Didn't matter if you played tennis, it was just the shoe. It's these models that really stand the test of time. You think of Run DMC holding the superstar on stage. So when you think about what Germany has produced, to sneaker culture is as big as what any country has produced towards sneaker culture in the world. Those shoes are a prominent part of what is cool, but also what is classic and what will always be cool. Many people know that Germany was divided in two parts, East Berlin and West Berlin. The city was divided, the whole country was divided. It was uh, pretty emotional. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. <laughs> but for us on the west side, it was pretty good living, I would say. We were free. We were free to travel. We were free on TV. We had the possibility to watch MTV and to see all the stars we were knowing from the radio. All these people influenced us. On the West Berlin side, motor for everything was the hip hop. Run DMC, Beastie Boys, EPMD, Public Enemy, LL Cool J wearing Jordan 1s. So for sneaker people on the West, it was pretty good because we had the possibility to buy stuff which you were not able to get in, on the German market. Hikmet is a key figure. When he started his own shop, it was the only place people really went to to meet up and talk about sneakers. Hikmet is one of the founding fathers of sneaker culture in Berlin. Most of the guys that did this shit before it was cool to do this had to really love what they did. Because most of the guys that founded the early stores weren't making a ton of money in the beginning. They just really loved sneakers. I have the big luck to make my passion to my profession. 
I already started in school to get shoes, which others don't have, and I resolved this. But it was not on the purpose to make money with it, the purpose was to get new stuff. If you were collecting in the former Western part, you would definitely be collecting Jordans or Dunks. But of course also uh, shoes like the Puma Clyde, so classics of hip-hop uniform were very popular in the former Western part. A timeless classic, for me this is 100% hip-hop. I think it was uh, pretty popular for b-boys, uh, for breakdancing, due to the grip of the soul. So this is history. Not everybody had the possibilities to buy brands which were expensive and Adidas or Puma was not cheap. So this is really tough to say, but there was not really a sneaker culture on the east side of Berlin because uh, they don't had access. And then 1989, the wall came down. It was uh, pretty interesting to see the difference between the taste of West Berlin people and East Berlin people. Imagine growing up in a place that you could only buy what was being made in that specific place. East Germany was only allowed to live through German products. You can still tell, though, that the sneaker culture in Berlin is still divided by the East and West. So the Eastern Berliners usually have a slightly different sneaker taste than the Western Berliners. I was born in the East. Normally the people in the East, they didn't have so much money. When I was young, people around me really liked the most quality shoes, the most expensive shoes, because it was a status symbol. I think in the West you are really inspired by trends from the US, but the people in the East are more inspired by soccer culture, more deep into running silhouettes, really deep into Adidas products. So it's different uh, inspirations. Mark from Overkill is a former East Berliner who is giving the former Eastern Berlin sneaker culture a face. It's rare that a store's name actually defines what the store feels like. I have never seen that amount of colors per style in any store in any part of the world ever. And just the spray paint. Not just a section, but a shrine to spray painting in the middle of a sneaker store, and that be part of the signature. But when you travel through Berlin, you understand why. Because graffiti is a big part of Berlin culture. So in the best products in the 90s, especially in the east of Berlin, are coming from Adidas like the ZX series or EQT series. Puma and Adidas have a big uh, impact here in Berlin because the east was more limited by uh, German products, but the uh, quality was really fine. Mark is also Mr. Equipment. I mean, he's mostly known for his extensive Adidas equipment collection. I got to look a little bit through his archive and I have to say it's very, very impressive. Yeah, let me introduce. This is the Adidas uh, EQT Guidance. This is one of the most popular shoes for me and for collectors around me because this shoe stands for quality. Why the EQT was so popular? So one, it was an immediate status symbol for everybody that wore it. It was something that defined the market as one of the most expensive shoes that was available. But it was an excellent shoe to fight in. When you look at football culture in Germany, that became the fighting shoe of choice. It was a very stable shoe, it was lightweight, but it was also something that you looked good fighting in. In the district where I was born in the east of Berlin, often I go to a soccer games. And so for me, it was really interesting to see how's the outfit of the cool guys, the expensive shoes, nice leather jackets, especially the hooligan culture for a young boy like me was really, really crazy. With this shoe, uh, I do a lot of parties. I visit a lot of uh, soccer games and uh, sometimes also some f fights. You never know. At this time, there was Supreme, there was an A-Life, undefeated. There was sneakers and stuff already, but there was nothing like this in Germany. After a while, I thought to myself, okay, why not to open your own store?
Soulbox was one of the original stores in Berlin. Almost everybody that we speak to from Berlin lined up at Soulbox to buy their shoes. I never opened a store to make money. I opened a store to get access. You know, like a DJ um, is doing a record store. Uh, so you have first access on the records and you pay half price for the records. This was my aim. Hickman was probably the first person in Berlin to have a kind of retail collaboration with major brands. Soulbox was really like a hub for sneaker culture because collecting became a trend. And of course, this uh, resonated here in Berlin. The funny thing is the first lineup in Germany was at my store. And this is more surprising maybe, it was for a Puma shoe. It was a Puma Yo MTV Raps. It was the first time that in Germany people camped for a pair of shoes. It was this one. I was knowing this from US, but not uh, in Germany. I was the first one who was caring about this new clientele of customers. It was not customers for me, it was a community. And the first people who camped in front of my store was uh, the co-owner of Overkill. And Mark spent a lot of time in front of my store camping for shoes which I sold back then. Pigmet, I met him first time at Soulbox. I stay in front of the stores many times for different campouts, mostly for collaborations. Later, I do my own business here at Overkill, and then we are competitors. Overkill was growing more and more from year to year. The sneaker hype is going bigger and bigger. They create limited products, shop collaborations, artist collaborations. Ten years before, you have a limited release every two months. Now we have five limited releases every week. Everything changed. This one was here somewhere, let me check. All this stuff was really good organized in the, in the garage. So I had it alphabetically, so starting at Adidas, going up to Vans. If you had more than five pairs of sneakers, you used to be looked at as strange. Everyone who was into sneakers built their outfit from the feet up. I think we were waiting for pop culture to catch up. What we've seen the last years is there's an intersection between sports, music, and fashion. Puma created the lifestyle category in general because everybody else was developing sneakers and footwear to perform, but Puma was the first brand to have the angle of fashion and style. Approaching a partner starts with the fact that we are interested in the creative world. Now we have Rihanna designing fashion product with a sport company. The Rihanna collection was such a smart collaboration and did so well for them. She knows exactly what she wants down to the execution. We believe in open source, which is having a perspective of humility, that we don't know everything and we want to collaborate with the greatest minds in all different industries. And that relates not only to sport, but it relates to culture. I mean, Adidas is the home for the Yeezy brand, Pharrell's brand, recently signed Beyonce. I mean, you, you have to bring up Kanye. It's been an incredible learning for our brand on how you collaborate. You know, that you need to take a back seat and really hand over the steering wheel to the, the person who's the most creative in the room. And that, in many cases, is our friend, Mr. West. The Yeezy stuff continues to confuse and befuddle, and that's great. It's what it should do. It's something we couldn't do alone. Kanye West shoes do not often look like anything else in the Adidas line. He has been allowed to work with their designers to create something completely new to this world. Collaborations for us are a way to, to bring the outside in. I'm just designing or sketching some shoes. Um, I um, have my own brand. And I'm uh, now doing the next silhouette, so it's uh, not easy. It's pretty um, difficult to have an own shoe brand, to be true. We opened Soulbox with imported stuff, but with limited stuff. It was pretty successful. I've done lots of collabs with all the brands, but I had a personal reason to quit the store. 
my dad had a heart attack. So I thought to myself, okay, you know what? Let's quit it. But you know Rocky III, Eye of the Tiger? I still had the Eye of the Tiger. So my wife and my kids said, do it. And I opened my own brand. So Puma was pretty loyal to me. After I left uh, Soulbox, I had the possibility to make again a shoe. By the way, uh, greetings to Yasin. They saw that one of the most popular suede were made by me. And so I got the chance to the uh, anniversary to do my own suede under my new brand, Sondra. I'm growing up with these brands. These brands are the reason why I've done my own brand, because I still love to wear Puma, I still love to wear Adidas. Nothing changed. Adidas and Puma have enough legacy models to fall back on, but they're innovating. Now when we see 3D printing on shoes, this is Adidas saying, we're going to drive technology as much as possible. Even though this Futurecraft 4D shoe is a science project, no one wants to wear a science project on their foot. They want to wear a shoe. The thing I love about this is the technology is rocket science. But the end result is something familiar, wearable, and yet somehow still exciting and modern and new. When you think of the fact that some of the most impactful brands in the world, some of the greatest technologies in footwear are coming from small towns in Germany. I think it gives you a lot of understanding of just how big the culture is and how important some of these brands are. Adidas and Puma as German brand, I always saw it global. And you know, we are living on one planet. The biggest thing what I love on sneakers is it's uniting people all around the globe. So I have friends in Asia, I have friends in the US, I have friends in Europe. And you know what? We don't talk about politics, we're talking about shoes.